All right, everybody. Welcome to the very first episode of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your boys, Brett and Crypto Humor, or CH, whatever you want to call me. Uh, quickly, wanted to give a shout out. Marty Bent, Tales from the Crypt podcast, Stephen Lavera, Stefan Lavera podcast, and of course, the Noted podcast with Pierre Rochard and Bitstein. If you haven't checked out those podcasts, please pause right now, go subscribe to those, and get listening. But, uh, all right, so, Brett, how you doing, man? I'm doing good today, you know, uh, looking at Bitcoin, looking at $4,200 Bitcoin after, you know, six weeks of consolidation or whatever it was where <laughs> we didn't move 1% or 2%. So, um, <laughs> it's uh, interesting, you know, it's, and we still haven't seen the capitulation, as we've discussed before, like, as much as blood has been spilled, you know, there's still this nascent idea you see, or rationality that, you know, some altcoins will cover. And, you know, I could be wrong, as, you know, I have been pointed out recently that, like, you know, Bitcoin just pulled off, well, it's the 24th today, November of 2018, and Bitcoin just pulled off a solid, uh, you know, pin bar. And you probably see it on the screen I'm sharing with you. Close yep. the volume here. Um, and so that's a high pro. It's a daily candle, so it's a higher probability, higher time frame, higher probability of it being a successful um, reversal. It would be very interesting. It would be... Uh, for all the people of Embarrish or, you know, people making ridiculous calls down to $800, a 1000 that, you know, was a face-ripping pump we just get, you know, and that would be pretty funny considering the times we're in right now. I mean, but. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think we are capitulating yet at all. I yeah. mean, uh, only a few uh, only a few people have, have ducked out here and capitulated, but. Until we see a few more rage quits, yeah, right, you know, those guys are done. Until we see a few more, uh, you know, capitulation stories, mm -hmm. much like the uh, the one we saw from Andy Hoffman, who is uh, <laughs> acclaimed I... financial analyst in the Bitcoin space, who uh, who dumped his bags, so... I didn't see we'll that. We'll see, so... hopefully he's the first of many. That's what I'm, I'm looking, looking up right he's now. He's the first of many. Because he, he probably yeah, tweeted there's... about it or something? He did, you know. I can send you a link. Yeah, he. Uh, there you go. Crypto <laughs> Gold Central. Yeah. Because I remember someone mentioned to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the guy basically, you know, he created his own ICO scam coin, you know, capitulates and then and then shills his his scam coin at the very end of his <laughs> of his blog post. So it's yeah. a little yeah. ridiculous, but uh, not surprising to be honest with you. Not surprising. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, here again, I think, and this is where I, you know, like to relate everything to the macro of things. You know, we're in a basically 10 year, very big artificial bubble that's been fueled by central banks. And I think we, you and I discuss this all the time with the importance of Bitcoin and, you know, not having a central bank control it, you know. Um, and you can, you know, we look at gold, we look at silver, and there's, and even recently, silver, you know, we see manipulation in the markets. And now it's official, you know, a um, trader from JP Morgan. You know, just you know, whatever, pled guilty, but you know, he's doing a you know a plea deal beforehand, and you know, and he's saying his higher ups, his supervisors, all knew what was going on. He learned from his supervisors when he was manipulating uh, palladium, uh, gold, silver, and um, I can't think the last one, um, platinum. You know, and it's here again. You know, it's clear as day. Like uh, I'm gonna pull up a silver chart here, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, a few months ago, in I want to say June, silver made a great run from 16 all the way up to, um, yeah, 16 or 16 bucks to 17 to a former uh, high. And the dump that day that happened, I've never seen before, you know, on a scale of like when it dumped, I mean, it dumped, it dumped from $17 and 25 cents roughly to 1647 like in you know and it, and i watched it happen i was like watching it live like on like five minute candlesticks and it was just absolutely insane um and so you you know the one thing i've learned through my short time as a trader i'm you know i'm not an expert by any means i'm just learning the ropes and is every market is manipulated whether you look at your equities market commodities foreign exchange um and crypto you know it's they're all manipulated in their own ways you know and they're and the in the equity markets, we have the plunge protection team. You know, they come in and buy assets. You know, if you look on Investopedia, they talk about like on February 5th in 2018 or 
when, you know, U.S. equities took that huge dump, you know, and where, you know, we had that, you know, rational exuberance coming into 2018, equity, you know, fund managers were talking about it's a great year, blah, 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 this and that. And then, you know, we went from like a very low VIX to a very high VIX, you know, and they talked about, it, you know, um, it just, it's different with the volatility we see and it's, um, you know, and so plunge protection team came in basically and bought up assets was there. They were a bid at the bottom, you know, to keep everything from falling more. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Let's talk about that for a second and, you know, bring it back to Bitcoin. So who are those hodlers of last resort that Trace Mayer always talks about? You know, the, uh, the buyers of last resort who yeah. step in and will be buying coins at particular price points. Um, you know, we have a lot of them. You know, the thousand dollar Bitcoin sounds great. Oh, it sounds phenomenal. A lot of <laughs> uh, long term hodlers, yeah. maximalists uh, of the like. So it, it's exactly you know for every seller, there's a buyer on the other side of that. And uh, you know, the two of us have talked about this. We both <laughs> will be buyers at multiple levels on the way down because of the fundamentals have not yeah. changed whatsoever. Yeah, anything, I've never they, been they more get, bullish they get, about. They Bitcoin. get better and better. You know. And I think that's a big point, and you see it in the news. Um, and I saw a good point that was made on uh, Twitter the other day. News always falls to sell off. So when you, and that's why you see news a lot of times will be a great point of, you know, pivot point for a market to rally. So when Bitcoin sells off, you know, down to forty four thousand, and then it rallies back to forty four hundred, the news is, you know, releasing that article at four thousand. The news will, ne you know, always follows that dump. You know, they're never preceding it per se, unless it's, you know. Unless it's like, you know, Goldman Sachs, CEO leaves, and then Goldman Sachs dumps in that minute. But generally, some insiders will know beforehand. Um, and you can see it like a great example. For sure. Um, was And I'm sure we've talked about this before, is that was Bitcoin Cash when it got listed on Coinbase back in December. And I'm going to pull that chart up if I can find it here quickly. Um, when Bitcoin Cash got listed last December, it was, you looked at the market, people knew way beforehand that it was getting listed. You could see the volume picking up. You could see people buying in. And, you know, people on Twitter were going nuts. They were calling out Coinbase, you know, for, because it was clear as day that someone was had prior knowledge that it was being listed, you know, and people profited huge. I'm just looking at oh, the Oh, for sure. Yeah, and the Coinbase, it went up to 4200 bucks that day. It got listed on the 20th of December. And then, you know, immediately I remember that day. dumped, you know, down to 1600 within the next few days. So, um, yeah, that's uh, your typical... Coinbase dumping their bags on retail investors, and they've done it. They, time. They've definitely done it multiple times now. With they the, did the same thing with all their yeah basic right. attention yep. token zero X. And the the best thing is, and we've seen it before, is the zero X connection with Coinbase. Like all the advisors on zero X have some kind of relation to Coinbase. It's just, um, and you see the stuff that would never fly in traditional markets. But since it's so, our market, you know, crypto is so nascent and it's so untouched by regulation that anything flies. You know. Like when Charlie Lee yeah. dumped his Litecoin at three, you know, not that he dumped the top, but, and I don't blame Charlie, you know, he's like, dude, you know, you watch this thing go to 300 bucks and like, you know, he knew that wasn't going to last. Like I remember, um, you know, after Thanksgiving last year, especially Thanksgiving, cause I was open about crypto and like my, you know, unlike you, you know, you're hidden behind crypto humor face. I, you know, people are like, you know, my face is out there. I'm crypto coitus or whatever on Instagram. And people saw me and asked me questions. And it was like people were very skeptical even in the fall last year when Bitcoin was moving up. But it was right around right before Thanksgiving, right around it. People were kind of getting interested because they're shit. They're making money. I want to make money, too. You know, it's that FOMO. It's that fear and greed cycle um, we see with, you know, every market. That's all candlesticks are. It's just people's emotion on a chart. And we saw it, you know last thanksgiving you know that that literally bumped it because you know every family's talking about it at the thanksgiving dinner table um and one of the great things was i came back to school um and i i was at the bar one night and i had kids coming up to me telling them how they're buying a hundred dollar litecoin and i'm just sitting here like motherfucker <laughs> it's you know, unbelievable i remember that um you know and people were you know telling me, oh it's a hundred bucks you know where should i hold to i'm like and I'm thinking these kids have no clue, you know, the rec the reckoning. If they don't know how to trade, which they obviously they don't, because they're buying a hundred dollar Litecoin, you know, after it's appreciated already, you know, a thousand percent that you know in the past six months. <laughs> um, right. It's, so uh, you know, it the hype and the fear and the greed, like you know, and it was, 
and as I said, like it kept getting, you know, I had people DMing me, emailing, calling me, you know, people like, oh, I'll give you this, you know, a thousand dollars. I'm like, no, I'm <laughs> just like, no. <laughs> um, you know, I even had family members in December saying, you know, I want to put money in the market. And I, I specifically told numerous people, no, at that point it was like, it's too late, you know? And I had no clue if it was going to end, you know, in a week or in two months, but you know, you knew we were near the top, you know, because everybody was talking about it. Everywhere. Right, exactly. That, that, that That's a good point when you're and I, I definitely, you know, fell victim to this of just peak hype last year, November, December, um, complete euphoria. You you think, you know, hyper Bitcoinization is just starting as soon as the pump starts. And, you yeah. know, that's it. The last time we go back down, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, you know, you get the big crash and, and you realize that nobody knows what's going on in the world and, and they won't be <laughs> they won't be buying Bitcoin anytime soon until it's, you know, forced upon them one way through another. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's, to, you know, to me, and what, you know, one of the harder things for me is I, you know, I've become more and more of a trader over time through crypto. And thankfully, because I love it now, you know, it's um, something I'm passionate about. I like looking at charts. I can stare at them all day. Just, it's cool to see, you know, and not that I'm going to stare at the same chart all day, but I like looking through stuff. Um, and, you know, I wish, you know, I'd focused more on TA, you know, prior about, I was writing a lot of articles last year then. So that was kind of my focus doing research, figuring out things. I can't tell you how many worthless fucking altcoin papers I read when I should have just been, you know, focused on TA of the altcoins, you know, the technical analysis side um, and not worrying about any sort of fundamentals or this and that, you know, because in the end of the day, the, you know, the alt, most of those papers I read were just worthless, you know, besides for maybe the Bitcoin white paper for the most part, most of them. I'm not saying they're completely worthless. You, you know, obviously I did learn things, but, but, big but, you know, that time would have been better spent elsewhere, you know, uh, you know, getting better at technical analysis. But, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I completely agree. If if you are listening to this right now and you are still reading shitcoin white papers, please stop. Yeah. You're, stop. You're, Close that window. Do not read that 40-page white paper. Uh, you know, yeah. it's it's a waste of your time. No, uh, you know, that's what I started to realize, you know, after, you know, probably January, February last year. You know, I still read some stuff up until probably March, but it was like there'd be like 45-page white papers. And I'm like, I can't even find the value proposition in this. They're just trying to, you know, and they're, you know, they're using buzzwords. They're saying how they have experts in this field, this and that. But it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, yeah, Bitcoin white paper, nine pages long. Short, exactly, short. To the point. You know, I don't know the exact hour they announced it, but it was clear as day when you looked at the you know volume analysis that before they announced it, I think that's where the announcement is. You see that huge fucking two-hour bar there, like right mm -hmm. there. Um, it was clear as day that people were buying beforehand and the market was already trending up. And that's when we got $4,000 Bitcoin cash, and it was like, oh, is Bitcoin cash going to be the next Bitcoin? Like, And that's what I love. You get like... Like I've lost all credibility in mainstream news, you know, after being crypto because I was some. I'm not an expert in crypto by any means, by any means, but I understand more than most people do. And when you see articles from CNBC, Forbes, Bloomberg, and you get these articles that are just off the wall and they have no clue what they're talking about, um, like there'll, there'll be articles by contributors saying something about Bitcoin Cash competing with Bitcoin or stuff like that. These guys don't have a clue what they're talking about. You know, um, there is a I remember there was a uh, Forbes article. Some dude wrote about how, you know, crypto is dangerous because he was buying altcoins at the top. He was buying in December and that he got wrecked in January. It's like, well, dude, you bought in the most euphoric of markets, you know, the biggest one of the biggest retail events, at least in recent history, you know, where, you know, nothing is compared. Um, so it's just it is what it is. But my, my uh, opinion of mainstream news and their ability to cover things with any kind of idea of what they're talking about is I've lost faith in that. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent on that. That's another good point to, to bring up. If you are getting your crypto news from <laughs> CNBC, Bloomberg, uh, Forbes, you know, do not read that. It, it is complete garbage. And actually something that, uh, I think we should go over in some other podcast, talk about yeah, we should... a lot of the FUD and misconception, you know, yeah. a, a, a hot topic right now is, is uh, proof of work mining a waste of electricity? Oh, yeah. You know, obviously it isn't, but uh, it, it's really uh, it's not that difficult for someone to fall victim to that 
piece of FUD and think, you know what, maybe we shouldn't use POW because it is so energy intensive. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a, you know, a different topic for another day. But the point is that FUD spreads very, very easily through mainstream news and media. So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind to find. There are so many great free resources available to all of us to really um, get good information. So I, I highly recommend not checking out your local mainstream news outlet. Yeah, I mean, one of the best things for me um, has been crypto Twitter. I never had a Twitter account until August 2017. Neither did I. <laughs> I um, I was never a Twitter person. Like in high school, I remember people talked about it. I was like, why would I want to fucking hear people, pardon my language, but why would I hear people bitch about their day or something? So I never had Twitter. And then, you know, someone mentioned about Twitter, and I kind of stumbled into crypto Twitter, and I was like, this is a lot of fun. Um, and definitely, yep. you know, I had I, the same experience having a pseudo anonymous account is I, you know, I envy those guys, you know, cause they can go shit post. They can really say what they want. Not that I don't say what I want. I'm pretty open about it. I got blocked by Vinny Lingham the other day because he was asking about, um, you know, <laughs> what do people want in the world? And like, it was like four different options, like something about equality, freedom and stuff like that. And I had, I was like, as a fifth option, dollar 50 civic when it was at its peak because it's at seven cents now. <laughs> And uh, that got me blocked. You know, the the, you just, the the ultimate Bitcoin counter trading indicator doesn't like it when you uh you know pretty much state that his project's pretty much worthless now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a good point, and 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 you're gonna see that. And he is a he's another guy. He panic sold, kind of said Bitcoin was dead. Went launched his own token for identity. It's a you know it's a complete disaster, relatively speaking. Uh, but yeah, you're you're gonna see this happen again and again and again. Hopefully this ICO uh, wave of ICOs might be coming to a close with, you know, the SEC starting to crack down a little bit more and hopefully people coming to the realization that we will not go backwards in time to I don't think we'll the ever worst see barter like again. economy we could ever seen. You know, I mean, the, it's, it's just not going to happen. We, are, we won't be switching back and forth a million times into these, you know, various tokens to kind of have access to these blockchains that don't work. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, um, you know, the great examples, we'd see all these issues with Ethereum, you know, and then so if you have issues with Ethereum, that means all the ERC-20 tokens. And for those who don't know, ERC-20 token is the standard or um, Ethereum token, which basically what was happening last year, and this is why you saw such a bloom in ICOs, was it didn't take any brains to launch an ICO. You could copy and paste code from a you know project, put in your thing, put in whatever your source code. I'm not even a developer. I'm just telling you the basics. Copy and paste code. You know, make up a shitty white paper really quickly. Launch a website, and that's all you needed. And that was, that was, and you could make yourself a paper millionaire like that. And that was why we saw this FOMO. Um, you know, it was absolutely insane. Uh, and like at one point, you know, I was writing articles about it in September and August, how absurd we were getting. You had Jamie Foxx promoting an ICO, Paris Hilton, <laughs> DJ Khaled, Floyd Mayweather. The game, the game and Paragon coin. Paragon just got in trouble with the SEC, paid a two hundred and fifty thousand yep. dollar fine out, and now they're you know refunding the money or whatever. But it was just, you know, people were taking advantage of the time. There's hype and FOMO, and no one knows the clue what they're fucking talking about. But they know they can take advantage of dumb people. Um, and, you know, I was I was writing, you know, I wrote an article about, you know, the ICO hype. And at one point in September, it was like five or six different ICOs per day. And that was for the rest of September. It was like I wrote this article in the middle of September. And I was like, yeah, on average, there's six ICOs launching per day. And it was it was absolutely insane. The ideas were so off the wall. They're like, um, yep, we're going to do Airbnb, like Beehive token it was a complete bust. I remember people were going crazy about that. You know, right around the peak in January, February, it sold out, and it never amounted to shit because it was just, oh, we're gonna decentralize Airbnb. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's a joke, right? Yeah. Right. It, it's almost unbelievable, and you know, a lot of these, you know, be careful, shit coiners out there. If you're holding uh, any kind of ERC twenty token, you gotta be really careful. Yeah. One 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 wrong move with Ethereum, and it's over. Exactly. That's it. Um, I don't think people realize, you know, obviously there, there's risk to every market. If you're holding a stock, that company could go bankrupt, you know, like Sears. You could just go to zero pretty much, you know. Um, it could be like an Enron. And, you know, the same thing goes with, you know, I can't remember there was an altcoin recently that like literally dropped 90% overnight or something like that. And that's the example. Like you have no clue. And you got to remember these things trade all the time. 
you, it could be Sunday night at midnight and you could be in bed and your alt clean could drop 50% for God knows what reason, right. you know? Um, so it's just, you can wake up to empty bags very exactly. easily, you know, um, or like for instance, when Bitcoin gold and I like Mona coin and a few others had their, uh, network, the hash rates taking over cause it was so cheap to take them over that a whale could come in and, you know, pull it off because or not a whale, uh, you know, People who have, um, you know, mining, you know, more hash rate, you know, and they're mining, were able to take over the network and just double spend everyone. Um, yeah, it's a it's a common problem. A lot of any POW coin right now, uh, especially one that's using SHA-256, is very vulner vulnerable to um, a 51% attack right now. It is not very expensive yeah. to... Uh, to perform an attack on an hourly basis. I think I saw something the other day, it was maybe 15,000 bucks an hour to to 51% attack a, I don't remember which proof of work coin, but I mean, it's possible. That will happen. Uh, these chains will get attacked um, because it's profitable to attack them. It will only cost $15,000 an hour to attack it and they could make, <laughs> will make more than that. Um, due to the attack, or they could short it on the exchange, perform the attack, and then and then profit that way. Yeah, and um, I'm gonna diverge a little here. Um, you know, I know we're talking about mining here, but um, I, I I like studying the macro. I've become a huge fan of looking at the macro and looking how crypto fit into this all. You know, because crypto is, you know, either way you look at crypto, Bitcoin's only been around since 2009. You know, first block mine then. We have been in a unprecedented time of cheap money, low interest rates, and we see it all around. We, you know, we, this year um, I just saw an interesting statistic: 89% of assets in 2018 are down against the U.S. dollar. You know, emerging markets are in bear market. Uh, U.S. equities are now in correction territory. I, mean, I can't think of what the you know European equities are at, but they're all either in correction or bear market territory. We're looking at FANG stocks. The FANG stocks that Jim Cramer on CNBC loved to tote about how great they are, this and that, are all done. They're either in bear market or correction territory. They're done. That was what was driving our market. You know, there was obviously other f stocks driving it, but Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google were the primary drivers, you know. Um, and, you know, we see this, and I, I finished a great book recently, Irrational Exuberance, the third uh, edition by Robert J. Schiller. And, you know, he talks, you know, I'm, you know, one of the things he talks about is in school, if you've taken any financial courses, they talk about the efficient market theory. Well, and it, basically that asserts that all financial prices are accurately reflect all public information at all times. Well, I can tell you that that very much contradicts anything if you've, you know, if you look at the tech bubble, if you look at crypto, because, you know, there's no way, you know, $4,000 Bitcoin cash does not represent, you know, accurately reflect you know, all public info on that coin, you know, it, it was, right. you know, there was no value to that at the time, you know, outside of, you know, the hype and enthusiasm. We saw the same thing with the, you know, um, tech bubble in 2000, you had companies like um, pets.com, you know, the globe.com companies that, you know, very little revenue. They were companies though. They were more than shit coins. They were companies, they had people that worked for them, but they had very little revenue, no profit, but there was hype and their market caps were through the roof. Um, so it's uh, yeah i mean the cheap money allows for malinvestment period exactly you know? and, perfect uh, and you know it's it, it it's bad out there even uh, you know a, an interesting example right now is i don't know if you have lime scooters or bird scooters yep. in in your neck of the woods yeah in detroit they uh, just brought those in yeah it's it's interesting because <laughs> i'm not so sure how profitable that business model is I, if I, it's being i mean they I don't, I don't know how many millions of dollars was raised by by bird and lime but i mean we're talking astronomical amounts and bird I'll as long as that money lasts long enough <laughs> you can you can perform malinvestment yeah and so bird for instance was valued it was recently 15 billion dollars i rode the i was in when i was in la back in may i rode the bird around don't go around it's pretty it's pretty cool it could be faster it's not good up hills but this thing had a $15 billion valuation, a $15 billion valuation from nothing. Like, and it was in the, what, I don't know how long birds went wrong, but it's not that long. And so it just shows you people are looking for yield. They're looking for yield out there because there's no yield in bonds. There's no yield in saving accounts. Right. So they're looking in the stock market. They're looking at, you know, speculative investments, whether that's crypto, which crypto is a perfect example. 
people didn't understand shit about crypto, but they were willing to throw money at it because they saw other people making 10 X's overnight. Um, you know, with these ICOs, um, you know, I, and I, you might've heard of Ian Bellina. He was, you know, big into the ICO guy. He was, you know, whatever he was big in this whole ICO thing. And that thing worked well for him until the market turned ICOs are absolute dog shit now. And he rode it very well. He rode that ICO train very well. That guy was flipping ICOs for a hundred X. That's absolutely insane. Um, you know, but you know, here again, as you say that cheap money and the bird, like, I think it's like, it's a dollar to ride and then it's like 10 cents a minute or something. So I, they're making revenue, but I don't know to what point, you know, are they justified for a $15 billion valuation, you know? Right. And they, and they pay users to charge those, the scooters up every single night. I mean, uh, I, you know, I don't know the exact numbers on it, but each ride from an expense standpoint is a couple bucks on, on bird's side. So, uh, you know, if they're not covering those expenses, yeah. that business model is not going to work in the long term. But now that we're talking about that, you know, like, let's fit Bitcoin into that picture. So what happens, um, you know, in the event where Bitcoin is sound money and that's what's being used, does that not allow for more malinvestment? And so that's a good question, you know, in, in the sense of like, if you look at the, you know, the history of gold and silver as money, you know, prior to World War One, you know, where, you know, World War One changed everything, you know, um, 1870 to 1914 was basically Pax Britannia. There was very little war in uh, Europe outside of the 7071 war between Germany and France. Um, there was, you know, it was colonies were expanding, um, and uh, you know, people never saw World War One coming. You know, and times were simple, and government was small. That was the biggest thing. Was before then, government very rarely pervaded into people's lives. It wasn't a big deal. The federal government was small, more localized, and after World War One, you saw that completely change. We had, you know, it was called the Great War. It was the war to end all wars, you know, and it wasn't World War One until World War Two came along, you know, 20 years later. But, you know, that thing dwarfs it. And I, I you know, I'm writing a book right now, and I talk about the difference between the 70-71 war, which was 40 years prior, roughly, um, to World War One, And, you know, the casualties in 70-71 war were right around a million between citizens, the French, and the Germans. In World War One alone, 1.8 million Germans died. And granted, yeah, World War One was four years long, you know, four years and four months. But the casualty difference was insane. You know, 18 million dead after World War One. Um, and you look at that and you say, how can that happen? How can you know? How can governments go to war for that long? And you know, it's simple right. as this: they are printing money. Company, you know, the inflation of currencies. I can pull it up right now. I think I have my. Um, if you get a chance, the Bitcoin standard, I know it might rub people wrong if you know people think, oh, it's going to talk about crypto. But this book is absolutely phenomenal because it goes over the history of money. And like the first half of the book doesn't even touch crypto. It just talks about the history of money from shells, you know, to bartering to et cetera, you know, to the you know, gold and silver money. And it goes, you know, it goes through a great amount of, you know, what um, here I have the World War One chart open. So World War One um, depreciation uh, currency. So against the Swiss franc, for instance. The U.S. Uh, dollar depreciated 3.44 percent. Uh, British pound 6.63 percent. Um, French lost 9 percent. Italy 22 percent. Germany 48 percent, and um, Austria-Hungary 68.9 percent. And so you know, these governments were only able to fund this war by printing more money. You don't have the ability to print money, you can't finance the war. Um, and that's right. that's one of the biggest things I note in my book was the difference, the scale of war was so much different on such a larger scale because of the ability just to fund it. And um, and while the inflation might not be recognized the day it's printed, months down the, the line, the inflation is recognized when the mon the currency makes its way back into the system, um, into the economy. And, you know, you know, right now, for instance, the U.S. with um, quantitative easing, and now we're going to quantitative tightening, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing around the globe, we're seeing asset prices, you know, depreciate. Um, with quantitative easing, you know, we went QE1, QE2, QE3, where the, you know, the U.S. was buying uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, MBSs, and, you know, adding assets to their balance sheet, which thus suppresses interest rates. And that's why, for instance, we had a, for the better part of six years, basically, we had um, a federal funds rate, which is the, you know, rate banks lend money, was at 25 basis points, which means a quarter of percent. So money was so cheap. You know, everyone could lend around, and that, you know, that allows for distortion. 
that allows people to think the stock market's rallying. And when you when you price the stock market in gold, there's a great website called Price in Gold. You can look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It has not hit a new high when priced in an asset that holds its value since 2000. The 2000 boom was the biggest by far any. It's called the Millennium Boom from 1982 to 2000. You know, the U.S. equity market for the most part rallied up and through that. And um, you know, and it hasn't seen a new high when when you really price it against an asset that holds its value like gold. And it's a it's a very interesting chart to see. I'm gonna pull it up here for you so you can see it, crypto. Yeah, that is interesting. I haven't looked at this chart before, but uh, I mean that really says a lot. Um, and that's that's again we're inflation, and so we know nominal values. We know the nominal value of a dollar. Like I know if I give you a dollar, you know what that is. You know what it's worth. But do you know its real value? I don't know the real value of a dollar. You know. I know that, you know, and that's the hard thing people, you know, we don't think about, we're not taught about in school. You know, you're just told, you know, from a young age, just money, it's a dollar. But you aren't, you know, you don't try to figure out what's the real value of it. Um, and if you can see this chart, I'm about to pull it up here. I can, yeah. So there you go, right there. So in 2000, you know, look, okay, so we're not even close. We're at 2018 and we're halfway up that 2000 peak. You know, we're at 750 ounces of gold, or grams of gold, excuse me, versus the 1,400 grams high in 2000 or 99, late 99. Um, and it's something, you know, you never see it covered on CNBC. CNBC is, you know, is touting in 2017, touting along the market, saying how great it is. Um, and, you know, you saw President Trump doing it with Twitter. And Trump's not a dumb guy. He was the guy calling this whole thing a bubble back in 2015. But when he becomes president, he doesn't want to do that, you know, obviously for incentive reasons, you know, better for him. But the, the point is here is we don't know the real value of anything. No one knows the real value of the dollar. So when you price stocks in the dollar, no one knows. No one knows. And now we're doing quantitative easing into quantitative tight. You know, now we're going to QT. We've never experienced this on such a large scale. Uh, Bank of Japan was the first one to do QE uh, back in 2001. And, you know, Swiss National Bank, Bank of England. ECB um, have all fallen in suit, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis. That was supposed to be our, our generation's Great Depression. Or, you know, that was, you know, that was, when you look at the charts, you're like, wow, you know, that should have ended it. But when you flush in trillions of dollars of money and keep interest rates stupidly low, where, where it's 0%, zero interest rates are negative, um, that's how you're able to have a, a fake recovery. And that's where we're at today. And that's a sad and scary statistic. Um. Yeah, it's it's scary. It could uh, the the next you know global recession whenever it comes could I mean we're, we're, <laughs> could make two thousand eight look like uh, you we're know, in the middle of it right nothing. now. There's no way. There's no way. I, I'm not going to argue with anyone on it, but we are in the middle of it right now. You know, you don't. I don't think people are realizing it yet, but it's happening slowly. And the great thing I was reading about ration, uh, rational exuberance was, you know, people knew prices in nineteen ninety nine. And early 2000 were as, absolutely crazy, but you know, and they would say it, you know, these, you know, these won't hold, whatever, but they still wouldn't sell, you know. Um, and great thing, I, you know, I was talking to my dad the other day, and he knows, and he mentioned something, you know, I think it's pretty interesting just from a psychological standpoint. He is a car salesman, and he was talking about, you know, he knows that the economy goes to the shitter, and he's talking about, you know, I, any day the economy goes to the shitter, and no one's going to want to buy cars. And right. you know, he's saying it. In a sense, but it, what really sticks to me psychologically is it's in his mind right now, you know, and I think it's in everyone's mind. You know, people don't want to admit that we're, you know, we're at the end of the cycle, but we are. Um, and it does, you know, you just, you look across the globe and you look at asset classes and look where we're at. Oil has went from 78 bucks to 50 bucks in a matter of seven weeks. Um, so it's a uh, very interesting time here and... Crypto was definitely 100% a part of this time of cheap money, of hype, and we saw it with the pot stocks. You know, when we saw Tilray, that had a $30 million, you know, $30 million in revenue, was valued at $21 billion. And part of the reason was because the stock itself, there was only 25% of the shares were, you know, um, float. The other 75% mm -hmm. were restricted shares. So, the you know, the supply was very small and the demand was crazy. People couldn't even get, you know, people couldn't borrow shares to short. So that was also an issue. You can't um, – the great thing they mentioned in Irrational Exuberance was like in 2008, 2009, and I think U.S. markets and other markets wouldn't allow people to short. Why? Because they didn't want them to go any lower. You know, they, they you know, restricted shorting stocks. 
and what that causes is you know if you can't allow someone to short it doesn't you know it doesn't allow it to go you know it um you're manipulating it basically is what it is and you know and it's and it, it should you know you should allow the free market to work that way you should allow people to short let them short eventually get short squeezed um but you know as i said earlier all markets are manipulated if you're going to invest you're going to trade just keep that in mind right the trend is your friend exactly the trend is your friend because I think there there were people who were completely bearish against Bitcoin for the most of 2017. And I can't make it think of any names off the top of my head, but these people watched it climb from a thousand to twenty thousand. You know, after it broke that former um, all-time high of 2014. And so, you know, one thing I've learned is don't fight the trend. You know, you'll. I'm not saying that it's very obvious when a trend ends, but tops don't happen. You know, very quick unless it's a pump and dump per se. Tops take time to happen. We're seeing in the equities market. The top is taking a long time for a lot of these stocks to turn over, but we're now seeing it. It's, you know, more and more clear. Um, you know, we look at Amazon. Amazon's topped. Amazon peaked at, you know, 2050. And I know it's a little off topic from crypto, but at the same time, these are all tied. And that, that was, um, you know, a discussion people had a lot was this idea that if, you know, the stock market hits the shitter, Crypto is going to rally, and and it, you know, I think when I first got into crypto, I thought that was a possibility, but the more time I spent in it, I realized one, why would anyone in the right mind take their money from a speculative asset and put it into the most speculative asset? They won't. They're going to go to cash. They're going to go to gold. They're going to go to silver. You know, um, and you're seeing it. You know, um, the smart money index right now is at its lowest point ever in history, lower than it was in 2000, lower than when it was in 2008. Smart money is out. They've been getting out all year. Why? Because they know, you know, they're they're out, they're smart. Exactly why it's called smart money. Yeah, that, that's a good point. You know, at what point? You know, for you and I, it's different. We we look at you know a, a downturn in the equities markets or just you know the, the markets overall and think, hmm, crypto seem or Bitcoin more specifically seems like a, a much safer bet to you and I than than to most people. But when does that narrative change? You know, what needs to happen? Uh, and, and this is becoming more of a popular topic over the last couple of weeks of how does the Bitcoin narrative change so that so that the average person gets it and thinks to myself, you know what, I want to allocate, um, you know, a few percentage points of my salary that I would typically keep in cash and allocate it to Bitcoin. You know what what needs to happen or what needs to change for the average person to to start believing that. That's a very good point. And, I, you know, I think. Um, you know, the way that's going to, the only way that happens is loss of faith in their own currency. You know, when you look at Venezuela, it's a great example. You know, people are buying Bitcoin there. And even though Bitcoin's losing its value, it's nowhere near the rate that, you know, um, excuse me, the Boliviar, the Venezuelan Boliviar, has lost over the past five years. It's absolutely insane. Um, it, is, it has killed that country, it has killed their economy. And the only, you know what, this is a great example of socialism. And you hear all these socialist, you know, politicians in the u.s talk, you know a decade ago they were saying how you know venezuela is a great place look at how socialism is doing great they don't say a fucking word about it right now why because their whole country right. is ruined because of their currency when your currency inflates itself a million percent the, the paper is better off being used as you know kindling to start a fire it's worthless right um and the only people who are well off are the politicians the very 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 top one percent and like president madero they're fucking fine. They ain't starving. They're getting food. They have military protection. So it's here again is that, you know, that myth behind, you know, socialism and, um, you know, central banks can solve your issues. They can't, you know, um, they just don't. It will be interesting to see how Bitcoin is used in, in Venezuela. And, you know, more specifically, will will Venezuela be ground zero for Bitcoin? Will, you know, the people of Venezuela start acquiring Bitcoin through whatever means. And, you know, I've, I've had a couple people from Venezuela who, who DM me before and said, yeah, you know, times are tough over here. The electricity is cheap. So when people mine when they can, and, uh, you know, I can't imagine being there right now, but it will be interesting to see how given an organic option of Bitcoin, will the people and the government, um, start to ad adopt it just just naturally and you know somebody made the the point the other day 
um, Mustap Murad on Twitter. Go follow him if you're not already. Who was saying how uh, <clears throat> you know the, the the people who need censorship resistance the most will use Bitcoin the most, and the people who need to um, keep funds secure where they can't get access to the financial system otherwise will will use Bitcoin. So it will be interesting to see how Maduro and Venezuela. Uh, you know, we know they've already been um, seizing mining rigs that are trying to be shipped into the country you know do they are they mining right now you know that's a question i think they are um and you know we'll 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 know that probably in the next half decade or a decade (laughs) that they've been uh that they've been mining coins for however long and uh you know we'll, we'll be able to see that play out in real time yeah and um you know it you know i think a lot of us have to realize sit back and think about long term here you know Bitcoin is very new. In the in the grand scheme of things, it's you know ten years old. Um, we're about to come up on you know they they had this whole thing about that ten year birthday or whatever. The real ten year birthday comes up on January third when the first when the first block was mined. Um, you know, and it'll be interesting. I see these comments. You know, they just see if uh, Bitcoin outlasts you know the euro. The euro has only been around for twenty years almost. I think two thousand two. So it, you know, so yeah, less than twenty years. Um, It'll be very interesting to see. Cause my opinion is the European Union. I don't think will make it to 2025. You got Brexit right now. You have Italy issues. Um, you look at Germany. Germany's a powerhouse. Um, you know, and then you see. And I, this is a little topic, but you see the whole migrant crisis they're having, um, and you're seeing the whole nationalism side of it. Um, and I think very shortly there's going to be no European Union. It's going to go back to you know they're going to have Deutschmarks. They're going to have Franks. Uh, you know, there's going to be no EU shortly. And, you know, because it was a a whole myth based on this giant collective, you know. And here again, where EU or the ECB, European Central Bank, has been just printing off money just to, you know, keep things going. It's the same thing that every other bank's been doing for the last decade. And we, the distortion it's causing is only going to make the pain worse. The the way I think of it is in 2008, we, you know, instead of really having pain, and there was a lot of pain, don't get me wrong, we kicked a can down the road. So it's not this politician's fault. It's not these people's fault. Now it's going to be these people. But this has been a collective, you know, years, decades of decisions that have led to this point. And, you know, unfortunately, this is what happens. You know, you fuck with the money supply, it's going to come back and bite you. You reap what you sow. Right. And that's a, <laughs> that's a good point to mention to, uh, you know, brush up on your Austrian economics, everybody, or just get yourself a copy of the Bitcoin standard. Listen to it on Audible get through it because this has happened over and over and over again throughout history. The money supply of, uh, of an economy gets inflated. It blows up and you know, the, the cycle repeats, you know, the, the boom and bust cycle is, is not, is not caused, you know, for fun or for, for no reason whatsoever. It's from uh, credit expansion and cheap money. And it happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I, you know, I don't know the accuracy of this statistic. It's something, you know, the average fiat currency lasts for like 40, 40 years. I mean, we're not talking that much time in the grand scheme of things. No, it, you know, every person will live through that once in, in their lifetime or, or possibly twice. Uh, we've seen, you know, countries hyperinflate in our lifetime. Argentina's repegged to a new currency two or three times already, uh, you know. European Union switched to a whole different monetary standard. It will be interesting to see how that, you know, we're going to live through that again. And if it's a Bitcoin standard, that'd be fantastic. But, you know, that organic adoption is 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 really what we're all kind of waiting for at this point. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have my Bitcoin standard open. And one of the greatest examples of fiat currencies and the collapse of an empire is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire dominated the Mediterranean in Europe, you know, um, you know, around, you know, 0 AD, BC, whatever, around the times of the Bible time, whatever. And um, a great example is that, you know, they had the the uh, gold Aurorius coin and the silver denarius. Um, and, it, you know, the Aurorius started off with 8 grams of gold and the denarius at 3.9 grams of silver. But over time, um, you know, Julius Caesar was one of the last dictator of the Roman Republic, but it started with um, the emperor Nero. And he began with the you know famous Roman habit of coin clipping, as they say, where, you know where yep. you know they would take you know amounts of gold or silver out of it to inflate the currency. You know you want to make create more coins. Well, eventually the denarius, you know, silverware is a lot easier than gold, and that's why gold has this standard of holding its value for a long time. 
gold is very impermeable, doesn't doesn't corrode. Um, you know, the only downside of gold is it's heavy, but that's what makes it valuable. You know, can't destroy it. And with silver, the thing was is these silver denarius coins. They got down to so little silver that you know, after being passed around enough, it was you know, copper on the inside. The silver was gone. It just got worn off. And so with this inflation, you know, it destroys societies. And then you saw the decline of the Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire collapsed, you know, what happened to Europe? You went to the Dark Ages. Um, you went to the time of uh, divine right. That's the divine right time where you had society, where you had, you know, very, very upper echelon people, the kings and the queens of the time who ruled over a bunch of serfs and peasants. These serfs and peasants, all they did was, you know, farm. It's all they did farm and they lived mis probably miserable lives i you know i can't attest for it but <laughs> you know and you look to these you know people who you know said that god gave them this right to be you know in this power position and you know whatever if they you know continue to do this they'll go to a higher heaven but you see what happens when you when money gets fucked up you have issues down the line you know it might not be tomorrow it might not be three years from now but you know this pain is going to come it's just inevitable uh, every everything in life is a cycle. It's as simple as that. Agreed, totally. I'm gonna send you uh, something since we were talking about, you know, com comparing Bitcoin and gold and fiat currencies. Um, VJ Boyapati wrote an awesome, awesome 40 minute article. It's a combination of four articles that he wrote. The you know called the bullish case for Bitcoin, and in that they show an awesome chart. Um, that really compares Bitcoin, gold, and fiat with all of the things that that make a good money. And you know, we were talking about durability as one of them, where where gold really shines here because it can hold its value through time, whereas fiat cannot. Right? That that same dollar that's been in my bank account is at minimum less worth two percent less every each year. and every year. Yeah. And you know. <laughs> And, and it's paper, right? You can rip it, tear and, it, light it on fire. There's, there's the, nothing know, durable about it. And that's the inflation we know of. You know, a great example is the Pentagon, um, you know, after some audits recently was missing, you know, 21 points, you know, 21, mil, 21 trillion dollars, excuse me, which is the size of our national debt. <laughs> uh, and you, you say, what, you know, and that's another thing, the, the, the whole debt situation. We can we can go on that tangent here in a few minutes. But um, I just want to go back to when you're talking about gold and even the same thing as silver. One of the things that makes gold and the same thing with Bitcoin such a, you know, in a, in a value sense is the high stock to flow ratio. And that's what makes it. So the amount of stock that's currently out, the amount of gold that's out there, whether it's jewelry and bullion, you know, or it's streets, you name it, compared to the amount that's being mined, that's being put into circulation. So even, you know, no matter how much, you know, someone dumps a shit ton of gold in the market, people are going to take it up. Um, the same thing with silver. So, you know, and when you go to fiat currencies, they have, you know, um, a lower stock to flow ratio. You know, the amount of stock of fiat currency is, you know, a lot lower because the government, you know, or you know, your central bank per se is printing it off. And, the, you know, they keep printing it off and we don't realize this inflation. That's the biggest thing about QE and QT. The amount of money that the Fed is just taking up $4.1 trillion at its peak on their, on their balance sheet. We don't see very few of those dollars actually make it to the economy. That's why we don't see that huge jump in inflation. Um, or hyperinflation, you know, but if when those dollars make their way back to the U.S., because um, that's the big thing, the, you know, the U.S. dollars hold as a reserve currency, it's the largest reserve currency. If those dollars do make their way back to the U.S., we will see astronomical inflation because of that. Yeah, and I wonder if if inflation isn't the 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 next narrative that helps drive Bitcoin adoption because. If you're not really, you know, I, I've never lived in a, in a place or a time when um, hyperinflation was happening. You know, mm -hmm. that, that that's a scary, that's a scary, a very thought. scary thought because but... <laughs> you know, your savings can be wiped out overnight. Um, you know, when you exactly. look at some of these statistics, like where, like in, like in, um, in in Germany, the inter. I I just bought a book and I haven't read it yet, but it talks about Germany um, during the inter interwar period years and how Germany, you know. And you see cases of hyperinflation where money, you know, overnight is doubling the value, you know, or it's, you know, inflating. So, you yep. know, what $1 was today is now 50 cents tomorrow. And when you go to these hyperinflation states, the velocity of money picks up. So when you when you have a um, 
you know, currency with a low stock or high stock to flow ratio, the velocity money is low. People aren't, you know, moving money around a lot. They aren't spending it as much because it, you know, it incentivizes savings, incentivizes capital formation. When you, um, right. when you look at hype, you know, when uh, the velocity money picks up, money's moving around faster, it's inflating. And um, the book is called Before the Deluge, and it's a portrait of Berlin in the 1920s. But, you know, in 1923, Berlin had enormous hyperinflation. People were, were buying bread as a hard asset. Bread was a harder asset than their freaking currency. And, you know, bread, bread molds after a few days. So that just shows you how bad the hyperinflation was. Bread was holding its value more than, you know, the Deutschmark was. And... Um, and that might, might, might have been the wrong term, Deutschmark, or I don't know if that was the correct one name of it at the time. But the point is, and when you look at hyperinflation, the causes, you know, hyperinflation leads to, it leads to dictatorships. It leads to, you know, very um, controlling governments. And so Hitler's first big rise came during hyperinflation. His first big speech. Right. Um, Not why? a surprise. Because, because people were experiencing economic hardship and they'll do anything to get out of it. And then, you know, Hitler went to jail for a few years, wrote Mein Kampf. And during that time, we had the Roaring Twenties. It was experienced not just in the U.S. but globally. You're, you know, obviously certain countries weren't developed at the time, but in Europe they were experiencing it too. They were getting that wealth effect. And so Hitler seemed like an idiot. But lo and behold, October 1929 comes around, and the end. You know, um, you, you you go through this you know economic crisis that's never been seen on that scale before, and that's when Hitler really made his big run. Why? Because people have no clue where to run to. And this guy is preaching something that works, and he turned that country around. Time magazine made Hitler person of the year for 1938, and you want to talk about one of the most regrettable things you could do. That was it, you know. But Hitler is deemed this god. Henry Ford loved him. Um, you know, Henry Ford was, and Henry, not to say Henry Ford's a bad guy, but people liked him because he turned their country around. He made the Audubon. What happens when you have hyperinflation? What happens when you have currency crisis? What happens when you have terrible economic times? People will go to, you know, believe anything to get themselves out of that situation. Absolutely. I mean, you know, somebody's telling you that uh, <laughs> when the government tells you they can save you and take care of you, you know, they want you to believe that. Yeah. And most people do. Hook, line, and sinker, for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, you know, in, you know, as we were saying earlier, we we're going to talk about corporate debt. I mean, there's so many things we could discuss. Corporate debt, pension liabilities. I mean, it is a very scary time. Um, there's, if, if you're an American, you can just look it up, pensionsunami.com, but there's an ever growing pension crisis across the U S pensions are just underfunded. They aren't, you know, whether they've had bad returns or not. And the problem is, is they can't go to bonds because interest rates are so low. So you're not getting a return there. So they're in stocks. Well, now you're experiencing a very, very tough time market correction. I can guarantee you the pensions in 2019 will not be doing that well because of all this money they've lost this year, you know, on stocks. Because these guys aren't, you know, traders per se in the sense that they're, you know, the way they're, you know, modeled is, you know, they're just trying to, and they have this, like, a lot of these pensions will have, like, 6% return, you know, that's their goal, 6% return per year, which is a pretty big target, um, you know, considering, you know, and that's always funny, we laugh about that in crypto is, you know, 6%, 6%, what the fuck, 6%, <laughs> I want, I want, you know, 6,000%, um, you know, and it's funny when you, and that's one of the things I learned coming back, you know, off crypto and trading other assets. Is just, I'm like, wow, I 100% return on that trade. That's huge, you know. But like in crypto, I was like, oh, only a double, nothing. Um, you know, it definitely spoiled me for a little bit, um, especially you know when we had that you know huge hype pump, uh, you know, in December when you know you couldn't be wrong no matter what coin you're holding, you're up 10,000%. <laughs> right, um, everybody's right in a bull market. Oh, exactly. Um, and tide comes in and then it goes out. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't know. I would be concerned if I were a government employee right now and I were getting ready to retire in the next couple of years. I would. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'd be a little scared. Uh, there, there's no reason not to. I mean, there's so many uh, underfunded liabilities. I think it's like 68. It makes our national debt like 68 trillion or something when you include the unfunded liabilities. Like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. Like Medicaid and Medicare are going to be out by 2026. I'm just pulling this off the top of my head. They're going to be done. They're not going to have funding. And then Social Security is going to be done in 2034. If you're a U.S. citizen, you cannot rely on that shit. 
you have to realize that right now that that shit's gonna be gone, and it's gonna be gone a lot faster than you think it will. Um, yep. And you know, here again, we always joke about. I think you know, crypto. Him and I are younger. Uh, I'm 23. He's well, you're close to 30, right? Yep. So you know, we're younger, and this whole you know, boomers were born in this time of you know, great social welfare and these programs, and you know, people were led to believe these things would be around forever, and they you know they have been per se. You know, they've been around for 40, 50 years. But here again, we were talking about earlier, you know, it's less than the span of someone's life. So we're going to see this thing end in our lifetime, and a lot of boomers will see it end in their lifetime. Um, and it, it's a scary thought. And I was seeing something about, like, the amount of um, baby boomers that, you know, aren't, you know, barely have any money saved up for retirement. You know, what are they going to do? You know, um, it's – and here again, you know, we have to go through a system reset to get some back to normalization. We are in a very unnormalized time. It's as simple as that. That's the best way to put it. Yep. Man, I, when, you, when you say that, that, that reset, you know, <laughs> it, it, what happens? And I mean, you know, it's it's it, just, I, I've heard a couple of people say, you know, on, on, on crypto Twitter that, you know, Bitcoin could be that, that reset of our social operating system and, it, it, you know, change everything just to, when, when money stops working globally yeah. um, and, you know, things get back to reality, that reset could be very different from what you and I know as a reality today. It's going to look very, very different. Yeah, and, you know, the, and the thing is, is, like, we live in a time where you have access to so much information, whether whether it's books, whether it's the Internet. You can get anything you want to learn, but people are still so – and I'm not saying it in a, in, a, in a mean, harsh way, but people are dumb. They don't, you know, they're going to go watch TV for hours. They're going to go watch a football game, and they're not going to be focused on what really matters. And then when the hard, you know, the hard reality sets in, when something harsh happens, they they, they can't figure out why. You know, why is the market crashing? You know, in 2008, people, you know, people couldn't believe it was happening. No one saw it coming. You know, um, and it's one of those things again where I said 2008 was supposed to be the reset, but central banks didn't want it to happen. They stopped it. You pump the market with trillions. You bail out companies. You uh, Fiat or not Fiat Chrysler was Chrysler. Daimler Chrysler then was bailed out. Um, GM was bailed out. Ford didn't take a bailout, but like you look at like you know they let certain companies you know go under. Bear Stearns, Washington Mutual went under, but like AIG, which is a Fortune 100 company, they weren't letting that go under. You know, they didn't let Goldman Sachs go under. Um, and all these companies were going to go down. It was just that was. They had way too much exposure, way too much leverage to the whole mortgage market. And what they did, they saved the system. But, you know, by doing that, they didn't allow a reset. They didn't allow free market to take action. And as I said earlier, all markets are manipulated. Um, in crypto, you see it all the time. You get spoofing. But the thing is, is it's going to have detrimental effects. That's what I try to tell people. There's, you know, there's no way around it at this point. You know, you can, you can try to say, oh, you know, you know, the one of the great things I saw was there was this thing saying like fund managers, there's going to be a slow economic slowdown in 2019. You know, majority of them said yes, like 75, 80 percent. And then, you know, the next question was, will there be a recession in 2019? And, you know, it was like maybe 10, 15 percent said yes, there will be the other 85 percent. No. And that just shows you where they're at. They know it's going to slow down, but they don't, you know, they're not going to say that we're going to have a recession. Um, so. That's my two cents. Right. So, so let me ask you this: Do you think, do you think the next recession that you know, arguably we're we're in it right now? I, I think we're, we're, we're right seeing now. the market. No, you know, it's, you know, and the markets always precede the actual recession. Um, exactly. So hindsight's always twenty twenty. What are the chances that we are in another two thousand and eight, and you know, we just prop the system right back up again? Is that do you see that as a possibility? You know, I, I follow that, guy, that uh, the big one might be the next one, actually. It might not yeah. be this one. Um and so yeah, that's a good question. You know, someone said, you know, uh, a guy I follow on Twitter, um, named Occupy Wisdom, O W. Um uh, he, he mentioned something, he's he, he says QE four. So we had QE one, two, and three. He's like QE four is not an investment thesis. What he means by that is quantitative easing number four. So that'd be the Fed dumping more money into the markets is not an investment thesis. And why he says that? If they do that, one, they'll have to suppress interest rates again, and thus the, the the confidence in the U.S. dollar will go down. Like, for instance, Russia dumped all their U.S. – Russia doesn't hold any more U.S. treasuries as of, like, August. China has been dumping U.S. treasuries. A lot of countries are dumping them. 
acquired because they realized they shouldn't have that much confidence in them considering, you know, how our money supply works. Um, and a great thing was, uh, you know, I was going to go back to what you were saying earlier about the recession. And like January 2008, Ben Bernanke, who was the Fed chair at the time, stated, you know, the Fed does not forecast a recession. That was a complete lie, no matter what way you put it. You know, a few months later, we're in a recession. Um, and then Jerome Powell, who's the Fed chair now, back in September, said something along the lines about, um, you know, they are not forecasting recession. It was a very similar phrase. History repeats itself, my friends. And um, unfortunately, you know, any way I look at it, I don't see 2019 being any better. And, you know, could crypto rally? Maybe. And the only way I ever see crypto rallying is you get up, you know, a Bitcoin price jump up. You know, um, you have to have Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the only way the market will jump. And even right now, I'm looking at Bitcoin's down at 4100 right now, 4140. Doesn't look too pretty on the four hour. To be honest, low time frame looks pretty weak. Um, you know, I said there's a possible turnaround with the uh, daily, but you know that's again, it's trading's about probability of events. Nothing's ever guaranteed. Um, and here again, we could be looking at you know by the end of today, we could be looking at a three thousand, you know, thirty-eight hundred dollar Bitcoin. You know, for all we know, um, this is gonna be funny. It'd be pretty funny if it happened during the podcast, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it'd be great. It'll uh, give us a lot of ammunition to go make some memes and get them out there for oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I mean, and also if you're in crypto, one of the one of the greatest things I learned about crypto is move slowly. There's no rush to go into buy anything. Look at high time frames of charts. Don't move fast. Don't make quick decisions. Um, because you have a lot more time than you generally think. If you're going to make a trade, if you're going to buy something, have a plan to buy it. Don't just go buy it because it's pumped up. The worst thing you can do is chase a pump. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'd, you know, to lump both of us in there, I'd say we're both pretty bullish on, on Bitcoin overall. But in no way does that mean you should just go out and buy Bitcoin yeah. right now and, and invest your life savings. Into yeah, it. Don't go, if you guys don't have questions, shoot us DMs. I mean, there's plenty yeah. of free, awesome information out there online podcasts um you know you could read safe dean's book the bitcoin standard as a great primer but you really need to take responsibility educate yourself on the topic and then decide if it's something that you're interested in but if not you will get wrecked for sure yeah um that is 100 percent sure I, you know I, I think i sent you that message a few weeks ago you know a kid he got into crypto because of me and you know, he had all the time in the world to buy like two hundred dollar Ethereum. I mean, he didn't buy it to like eight hundred bucks or something. You know, and this is you know, he had and he was buying other coins at the time, but you know, I remember I told you, you know, he sent me a message about him being pissy about, you know, dude I'm down this much and I told him I I I told him when I was selling my stuff. I told him, you know, I'm selling my stuff now because, you know, when Bitcoin didn't, you know, go back over ten K back in May, I was like, Okay, well Bitcoin's turning around, the rest of the market's gonna follow and so it did and like you know, Bitcoin was being choppy, and what that do? Alt just bled slowly. You know, um, and that's what you know happens. And you know, he didn't. He lost a very small amount. It wasn't you know anything crazy. And I was like, I, I told him, I was like, dude, if you had to live for the freaking portfolio swings, you know, I had, you would you would have a heart attack. Um, you know, I think, <laughs> I think we could both speak for that. You know, um, you know, one of the worst things for me was, I, I you know, I bought a shit ton of Sidecoin at one point. Because I, I was following it, you know, I was one of the first coins I bought, but I bought a shit ton, you know, because I kind of, I started to figure out trading at that point, like in the fall last year and like looking at cycles and like I was looking at charts on coin market cap, but I was like, yo, you look at the chart and it's like parabolic and it comes down towards this accumulation phase. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, if, you know, I'm like, I'm going to buy a shit ton here. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But if I'm right, I'm going to be really right. And Sciacoin went from like, I bought it like 0. 0.0033 cents. So a third of a penny and it you know went to 11 and a half cents but if you know anything about Sciacoin, they uh they, they did a fork in early december and so it screwed all the wallets well exchange wallets you couldn't sell you couldn't move money i being you know a safe crypto person had moved money off the exchanges well here i am sitting with enormous paper profits after Sciacoin appreciates to 11 and a half cents and i'm sitting there with my brother staring at like we're staring at the chart and i'm just like dude i can't sell you know, and it was one of the worst feelings in the world because, you know, I actually wanted to sell at the top. I was like, there's, I, was like, I knew there was no way this was holding. I was looking at it and we went from like three and a half to five cents to 11 and a half. And it was like, at that point, there's no way this holds, you know, um, you know, 
And there again, that's the brutality of crypto. I was trying to sell the top and I couldn't sell it. I couldn't even sell it till it was five cents, you know. Um, but uh, there again, you know, it's a learning lesson. Do I hold coins on the exchange or do I, you know, keep them off the exchange? You know. Uh, yeah, that's a <laughs> that's that, that that that's a tough question. I you know I always tell people do not leave any coins on the exchange. Yeah. Uh, you know, you never know when an exchange can get hacked or in a situation where you can't unload your coins but uh <laughs> sometimes getting your coins on the exchange can be just as difficult especially oh, yeah. in a time when the fomo is real and you are trying to dump your bags onto yeah. somebody else unfortunately and it happens and it happens a lot and i have a feeling it will definitely happen again the next time uh we see a huge capitulation maybe uh you know, the Ethereum chain will, will get clogged up and you can't send anything to the exchange and you can't dump your bags. You know, that that's a possibility. It could happen. Yeah, and, um, you know, a great example is like what we had with one broker recently. Thankfully, one broker was able to refund everyone, but like um, one broker was just shut down. It was, you know, it had a, it was a .com, onebroker.com, and the FBI and SEC had been building a case against them for a while, you know, and they didn't act on it too. The FBI agent who, you know, they made this article um, – uh, they, they seized the address. Just a, they seized the address, so nobody could, you know, go to the uh, moneybroker.com. But the funny thing about it was, you know, the way they worded the story. The FBI, like this agent, made some secret things. And if you've used one broker, you know, it's very simple. You make an email and a password, and you're signed up. You know, and you also 2FA. Before we go any further, two-factor authentication. If you are in crypto or anything in life, and you have accounts, use two-factor authentication. It's very simple, and it will save you headaches from being hacked. It's way too easy to hack accounts, and I think CryptoHumor can speak on that. For sure. Yeah, use 2FA. Do not um, do not use the SMS text. Your phone can get ported at any time. I mean, we've seen – I don't know if it was someone who worked at Coinbase or not, but somebody who had a few millions <laughs> million worth of uh, – of Bitcoin on their on their Coinbase account, and their phone got ported and and drained. Somebody went in, drained their wallet. I mean, just sent it right off the exchange. There is nobody there to help you um, when things go awry in Bitcoin. I mean, yeah. it's no. th that that's it. Period. So you need to take <laughs> the security uh, a little bit more seriously than you would for your email. Yeah. yeah um. And a good way to put privacy. Um, you know, keeping privacy and, you know, security, stuff like that. It's very monotonous. Writing down passwords, you know, handwritten. I, I have multiple different hard copies of my stuff. It's very fucking monotonous. I don't like doing it, but I know it's the best thing to do. And, you know, it's it's when you don't take, you know, you lapse on your security is when you get in trouble, when you get hacked. Um, and so it's just one of those things, you know, be careful and be smart about it and take your time. Right. Take your time. You know, if you don't have a hardware wallet right now, go and get yourself one. We'll put a link to a few different wallets in the notes somewhere so you can take a look at them. But, uh, you know, we recommend cold card or, you know, if you want to use a treasure or an open dime, uh, whatever you do, definitely get a hardware wallet at minimum and get comfortable um, moving coins around so that it is not scary. Uh, anytime yeah. I move something from one wallet to another, it's it, it's scary because it, it's either going to work or it's not going to work. And if it doesn't work and you lost your coins, that is it. It's, it's over with. So um, be careful. Take your time. It's not rocket science. Yeah. And, uh, you know, stay and, safe for sure. One thing I always say is check your address. You know, when you copy, it, you copy and paste your address, whether it's Bitcoin or an altcoin or whatever, um, you know, copy and paste it. Double check it. Look at it. Look at the first three digits. Look at the last three digits. You know, do they match the address? Because um, there are certain um, Trojans out there that will, if you, like, have, for instance, have a Bitcoin address, and they'll copy and paste their Bitcoin address. So what happens is you end up just sending your Bitcoin to someone else's address, and they stole your money. That's right. It's as easy yep. as that. Um, and there's, you know, it's it's a very interesting thing, and that's why you just have to be careful. Um, there's no way around of just double-checking, take your time. Definitely, definitely. This was a uh, this was a good first episode. I think. Yeah, this was covered, awesome. We covered quite a bit, you know, and I, you know, we didn't obviously have a specific topic. We kind of just went around, but I think it's a good start and um, it's fun. I enjoy this. This is like decompressing. I get to talk about things I love. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you very so, much. So, uh, tell us what you think about this. You can reach out via DM or or message us anyway. 
tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. Are there any topics you want us to talk about for the next episode or in the future? And we'll, uh, you know, we'll take those suggestions and try to get them in there. And uh, I guess last but not least in the, the theme of the, uh, of the podcast, you know, eat beef and, and buy Bitcoin at a minimum. Yeah. Uh, one more thing I was going to say, we should probably mention our, whatever, our accounts or whatever, like your crypto humor on Instagram and you have crypto humor on Twitter. Do you have anything else yep. you want to No, follow me there on Instagram and Twitter at crypto humor. Yeah. And uh, you can follow me at crypto coitus, crypto underscore coitus, C-O-I-T-A-S on Instagram.